Hare Krishna Jayanand Prabhu. Welcome to the Monks Podcast. It's so nice to have you here. So, Prabhu, we have been in touch by email for quite some time, several years now, although we didn't meet any time. But uh, I think almost a decade or so, five, six years ago, we discussed about the concept of people's values and how they yes. shape their receptivity to Krishna consciousness. Since then, as I have traveled across the world, I've realized that people are so dramatically different. And that <laughs> idea of values uh, in, in terms of who they are and how they see the world, that affects them mm. enormously. So I thought we could discuss about that topic today, how people's values yeah. affect their receptivity toward Krishna consciousness or even to bhakti spirituality, to spirituality or bhakti spirituality specifically. Okay. So maybe you could start with a little bit about your spiritual journey, how you introduced to Krishna consciousness, and then how you mm. came upon the system of, in, of this idea of this values, how you stumbled okay. upon this. Yeah. Please. Yeah. So uh, my journey started when I, I read a book about yoga. And then a few years later, I kind of uh, decided that I'm going to spend now a lot of time on this. So I started with uh, the more like modern type of yoga, like doing asana practice, breathing practices. This was 1990s? But, uh, yeah, early 1990s. And where was uh, this? S Sweden or where? Uh, uh, that was in Finland. Finland, okay. So you, yeah. you have your base mostly in Europe in different places? You're born and brought up uh, there? I live in Sweden. Okay. Uh, this is the third time I live in Sweden, but I spend more years in Finland than in Sweden, but... Uh, Travel quite much between these two countries. Okay. Uh, so I started with uh, more physically oriented yoga, but I got quite interested. Oh, this is great. So I need to find out more about this. And then I tried out different methods of meditation. Uh, I also explored uh, chanting, Maha Mantra, uh, essentially to prove a friend of mine that he's wrong, uh, that this is not such a big deal <laughs> really okay. and then uh, after that experiment i just concluded that oh i just came across the best yoga method of all so ever since i've been doing that and after my initial kind of shock that how can this be so effective then i wanted to find out more and started reading uh books about Bhakti Yoga, and eventually I came to Prabhupada's books. And uh, oh, so yeah. you started chanting before you were introduced to Prabhupada's books? Uh, like I may I may have read a few sentences, but oh, uh, amazing! But I, I really had no idea what I'm doing. Like when I <laughs> oh okay, yeah. So anyway, so after that, I uh, got very much into the practice of Bhakti Yoga, all the while doing the Hatha Yoga type of practices as well. Uh, I was uh, studying at the university at the time, but I was uh, already uh, losing interest in what I was studying at that time. And then I, after a while, I moved into ashram. I spent, I think, five years uh, in uh, full-time ashram environment in Finland, Denmark, and India. After which I uh, moved out, uh, went back to university, changed my major to comparative religion. Uh, mm -hmm. Then I started a family and founded my own yoga school and like that. So, oh, just okay. so I have read your book on yoga. So currently, your that is your main focus of both profession and outreach yoga. Uh, yes, uh, particularly today, uh, I did work full time at the university uh, for eight years, uh, but that's stopped last year. So uh, with, uh, with research uh, in the field of sociology of religion, where I did my PhD dissertation as well. 
Okay. So you said and, uh, you, started, you went back to education for comparative religion, but then you went to sociology of religion? Uh, yeah, comparative religion is broad, so okay. uh, you can specialize in different ways. So I mentioned sociology of religion because then that became my specialization in my uh, doctoral dissertation. Hmm. That's good. So yeah, it seems uh, you had quite a journey. To, it seems so. So from your ashram environment to currently do yoga, uh, what what uh, you must have interacted with a lot of both in your university also a lot of people in the contemporary world in the Western world Europe you know, mainly Europe now. So how do you find uh, their receptivity to bhakti spirituality? Uh, or in general uh, to Indian spirituality or what is it that attracts them and what is it that obstructs them especially in today's world? Uh, I think as anyone ever, anyone knows uh, yoga is hugely popular today. Mm. They're talking about probably hundreds of millions of uh, practitioners around the globe. Uh, so it's big. Uh, but Bhakti, uh, how is the popularity of Bhakti and receptivity towards Bhakti? Uh, my own perception is it depends very much on how it's presented because people are really different. So some people are very much uh, into like group based religion. You want to belong to a group. And to follow a tradition, probably something which you were brought up with, which is tends to be the mainstream in the society where you live. So that's one approach. And then the bhakti is found in the religion, and that's that's okay. But then there's whole other type of approach, which is emphasizing individual piety more than uh, what is going on and how much I'm part of a group or not. Uh, so my perception is that particular people who are in the yoga field, they are quite much into this individual, personal practice and not so much into belonging to a group. So these are two very distinct, uh, distinctly different approaches to spirituality. And uh, then... Just a minute. If Bhakti you know, is... Sorry, one minute. When you say yes. that uh, there are two distinct approaches... So you know, on one side, I do hear a lot that people feel there is an increasing problem of loneliness in the Western world. And one of the major mm. reasons people want to come to a spiritual, spiritual path is because they want an extended sense of belonging. They want a sense of belonging and they want to be yes. a part of a community. So, so yes. are you saying that those who want to practice individual piety are different from this demographic? Or even when they want a belonging, they want some space. Yeah, that's how I would put it. So I think uh, pretty much everyone has a need for belonging. But uh, when we consider the different needs that we ha have, they are hierarchically arranged and the hierarchy doesn't necessarily look similar uh, for each person. So one person, the belonging might be the predominant need, whereas for another one, uh, the need for independence might be stronger. And for the person for whom need of independence is stronger than the need of belonging to a group, conforming uh, to the social norms uh, is uh, less important. Mm. So I'm, I'm not saying that there are people who don't <laughs> have a need for social interaction, but how it manifests, like how much you are willing to give up your sense of independence. Uh, some people want to maintain that. And I don't see that as opposed to Bhakti at all. Uh, there's this statement by Prabhupada that uh, Krishna conscious movement is meant for I don't remember uh, word by word by uh, cultivating independently thoughtful people. So uh, sounds to me like a person who has a Brahminical tendency at the same time can have a 
interesting bhakti, but uh, that's just a very different kind of uh, orientation. Hmm. So, I, yes. Now, this is a very interesting point. In one sense, is it uh, individual psychology right from birth? Or is it something which also grows with age? Because uh, <laughs> I've seen more and more that even in the Brahmachari Ashram, as devotees grow older, they feel the need for a little bit more space. So when they're 20, yes. we can just stay together in a dormitory with many others. But with 40, it becomes difficult. So yes. is this an ingrained psychophysical nature or is it something ingrained or is it something which also naturally evolves with the uh, with age? <laughs> uh, I would say from a basic like a Vedic point of view, it's uh, the psychology is formed by the sanskaras we carry with us from previous lifetimes. So from that point of view, because sanskaras manifest uh, not necessarily all at once. For instance, uh, sexuality is a good example. It's dormant until one comes to a certain age. So likewise, uh, many of the tendencies we might have may, may be somewhat hidden, dormant, and then they become more and more manifest as time goes on. So uh, yogic psychology point of view to this is uh, it's a little different from like Western psychology, because we are not growing up in a particular environment by accident. It's a result also of our karma. Okay, that's true. So karma in the form of our sanskars, the kind of environment where we grow up like that, it's uh, embedded, but uh, uh, from practical point of view, it might just look like it's a good explanation that depending on how and where we grow up, our environment where we grow up uh, does seem to affect quite much into how we become uh, later on. But then from Vedantic point of view, there is no contradiction because uh, it's based on what we did previously. So okay. that's part of our deep psychology. Okay. So, so irrespective of how we got where we are, each of us is mm. you can say, somewhere. And where we are <laughs> shapes our receptivity to, to spirituality generally, and specifically to bhakti spirituality. So, so do you feel that, uh, so how, how do you think, uh, is our presentation of bhakti more uh, community-centered, more uh, less suited for those who want to be, uh, need their space? So, uh... I assume you mean particularly the presentation of uh, ISKCON in most places. Yes. Yes. Uh, I haven't seen <laughs> that many places. My experiences are from uh, a very limited number of places. But whatever I have seen, uh, it seems to me that it, it works very well uh, for a particular audience. So it's, uh, I would not say there's any need to change that at all. But uh, outside of that, uh, there could be another kind of presentation, which could be just as true to the tradition and philosophy and the practices, but oriented towards a very different kind of audience. So it seems to me that the presentation, as it is done today, at least in the places what I have seen, is quite much uh, favoring people who are into the group oriented spirituality if you will and okay. as such then i think uh, it may be difficult for people who value independence uh, more <laughs> to grasp that was my experience by the way when i when i opened my own yoga school uh, in finland uh, nearly 20 years ago and um, then I put on my website that uh, part of the program, I'll be teaching bhakti yoga as well. But when I wrote that, I didn't have any clear idea how I'm going to do that. So it wasn't in the weekly schedule at the outset. And then at one point, I remember 
within the span of one week, five five different people contacted me either by phone call or by writing email that when is this bhakti yoga going to start? Really? And then I figure okay. out that I guess I need to start it now. <laughs> <laughs> so then I started a weekly class where, where I was teaching people basic ideas of Bhagavad Gita and chanting and kirtan and uh, uh, and I've been doing it ever since. Uh, and I noticed that uh, people are really different. Some people are like really everything. They don't have any problem going to the temple and interacting uh, with the devotees and doing the full thing. Whereas others, they're very happy by doing their private practice. But then when they encounter uh, what you would call regular devotees, it seems like there's almost these two kinds of people don't understand one another almost like they are speaking a different language uh, interesting so you know you yes. you are you are highlighting a different point over here quite often whenever i have also noticed that the challenge of outreach in the west is is becoming increasingly evident because our demographics are in the west especially in america are becoming quite homogeneously indian of so there is a matter of concern but so often the issue as con- issue of concern is said to be cultural that we present mm. ourselves as say indian culture or vedic culture or whatever word we use for it yeah. but so you are saying that apart from the cultural factors there could be psychological factors with respect to individual would you use the word values or orientation or nature whatever you use yeah so so yes. those so our presentation is geared for a particular kind of people yes uh, so I was experiencing this firsthand when I was uh, doing my own uh, small-scale outreach. I was noticing that there's something that uh, I don't have any problem personally interacting in both worlds because I've been doing it since day one. So I feel at home in the what you would call normal <laughs> contemporary yoga world. And I feel at home in the temple in, environment, so I can interact with uh, both groups. But I, I can see that <laughs> it seems that sometimes says the, it, the, it just doesn't match. And uh, w- why is that? And I was wondering about that. And when I started doing my uh, PhD work, uh, uh, then I came across a possible explanation which is exactly uh, related to what you just said, that people's psychological profiles are just really different. And it's not that there's one wrong and one right profile, but they are just different. And uh, based on the profile, then one is attracted to different kind of uh, environment and presentation and how the spirituality manifests uh, in terms of setting and personal interactions and maybe institutional or non-institutional and hierarchical or more equal and like that. So, you know, this brings us to a more fundamental question. That some, the way I was grew up in spirituality, in bhakti, it was almost like independence was considered to be a dirty word. In fact, uh, <laughs> <laughs> in fact, it is our desire for independence that has, has brought us to the material world. That is what will keep us in the material world. But then yeah. over time, I realized that in, it is Krishna who has given us free will. So the free will is not yeah. the problem. It is the, it is the misuse of the free will that is the problem. And each of us, if you have free will, we will also naturally use it according to our individuality. So then I learned yes. about, the, even within devotee circles, I learned about the differentiation between autonomy and independence. If, if we want mm. to use words which are, say, because sometimes in a particular tradition, particular words get a negative connotation. And once we yeah. start using those words, then it becomes uh, it becomes disconcerting. Yeah. So that a personal sense of autonomy is something which is required for every individual. And I've seen okay. also devotees yeah. that uh, if they are always depending on someone else for instructions about how to grow or what to do, mm. and if, the, if their guide goes away or the guide is inaccessible, uh, and then they just feel completely lost. It's like the end of their spiritual life. So I also noticed that, <laughs> that there can be unhealthy level of dependence also. So, yes. so, so you are saying, if I understand right, that uh, 
that for people who so there can be different people who require different levels of independence or different levels of autonomy yes. if you want to use that word and yes. okay. uh, our presentation is geared more towards people who who don't have a high a high need for autonomy is that what you're saying mm-hmm. uh maybe that's part of it because uh when i read uh probas books and commentaries so i come across both kinds of statements there's a lot of emphasis on free will i did my master's work about the wheel of time in the theology of uh uh hara krishna movement and uh the basic idea about wheel of time is that uh time is all powerful and uh, you practically speaking eternally rotate within the cycle of birth and death whether it's on the individual level or then you can take societal level societies go through uh, cycles and then there's yuga cycles cosmic cycles brahma's life mahavishnu is breathing in and out so everything is like is mind blowing <laughs> and uh within that frame uh then when we consider how shila prabhat presents uh, our position towards time is what i found out he's emphasizing very much both individual agency one should really take charge of one's own spiritual evolution and then also societal level he's talking a lot about the need to do something positive to change the world towards the better rather than just waiting for the yuga cycle to turn to the next <laughs> and uh, then even the in the most largest <laughs> scale of cycle the brahma's day we find is that lord brahma is taking birth as haridas thakur and making further <laughs> spiritual advancement if you will uh i'm hope i'm not offending lord brahma by saying this uh, but uh <laughs> arguably taking part in mahaprabhu's pastimes is a very fortunate situation anyway so uh, it came across in many places uh, that rather than just waiting for the time to take its course shall provide emphasizing quite much uh, that we need to do something <laughs> about it whether it's about our spiritual personal spiritual advancement or uh, about changing the world so uh, when i read it i i find both kinds of statements and uh but i think there might be something about it at least when i started my uh, own ashram experience back then at that time uh giving up one's uh, independent thinking was very much emphasize like one should not speculate one should just accept whatever the higher authority is uh, telling you to do which then brings with it the problem what if there are more than one authority giving contradictory mm-hmm. uh, instructions and or what if the authority is giving an instruction which is not in accordance with shastra and these kind of things so it seems that one cannot really ever totally evade the responsibility of uh, using one's own uh intellect uh true so and even the cosmic cycle you say that say i never thought of it from that perspective that although it's kaliyuga it's age of degradation but still we have lord chaitanya descending to this age and he is he's in one sense providing us facility to counter the default trends of the age so yeah. in that sense even his very descent is a testimony to the to the presence of human agency so if there were no human agency then even the lord couldn't do anything if, if we didn't have something <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's a good point so let's i, I have also recognized independent prabhupad also made statement like he wanted devotees to be independently thoughtful so so we could say that uh, some people need more space some people need less space in fact yeah. i also read that 
if the upanishadic spirituality in one sense was more more uh, individual more individual based in the sense that the sages they would wander from place to place and most of the sages would be usually alone it was yeah. more of when buddhism started coming in that buddhism for, for one of the principles of buddhism was sangam sharanam gachami that mm. uh, take shelter of the sangha the association so from that oh. point uh, the the communal small code or communal it was talking about celibacy or renunciation the communal monk hood started a uh, uh, communal renunciation started coming up more and more then that came back to the hindu tradition and shankaracharya formed the akhadas so mm. it and then of course in the modern vaishnavism we have had we have had more of uh, uh, communal or ashram centered spirituality so we do see yes. in the vedic texts sometimes there are sages a sage has one own one own hermitage even if the sage is a is a celibate or is married and there are there are, hermitage seems to be quite isolated at one place and there are others like vyasdev his hermitage seems to be quite isolated at one place but it is described that when ra when vishwamitra or before he is vishwamitra before he is a king when kaushik he goes to meet valmiki valmiki is at mm. the head of a ashram uh, mm. and he is the chief he is a chief priest or hermit or whatever and there are many others with him so it seems that uh, even in the in ram's journey through the forest he meets different sages and some mm. sages are living in a large community of sages and some yes. sages sarbhang sarbhang and sudikshna they are all alone and they are yes. practicing their spirituality <laughs> so um, so it seems uh, both are there bhardwaj is a sage who seems to have a lot of associates with him and yeah. uh, but others seem to be alone so it seems that both are there as precedent in the tradition yeah so it seems like it's bona fide that there are different kinds of people even in <laughs> spiritually <laughs> elevated circles yeah. i was just reading katha upanishad recently and what i found amazing is when nachiketa uh, first first he speaks back to his father <laughs> for a good reason but anyway that's already something and then father said donates him to death now he's waiting in the uh, waiting to for yamaraj to come back i don't know where he is but he's not there so he needs to <laughs> sit and wait for a couple of days and then suddenly yamaraj is like okay so uh, <laughs> how can i pacify you can i offer you some boons and then he's asking his famous questions and then yamaraj is trying to talk him out of it like okay the third question is that's something like he's testing him but finally he's saying that a teacher who has a student like you i'm just speaking in my own words is is very fortunate in other words he has a one to one discussion between teacher and student and teacher is having very much appreciation to the fact that the student is coming up with these very difficult and brilliant questions so it really doesn't sound like an authoritarian system where somebody said this is what you should do and don't argue back and but rather the mutual appreciation about a good spiritually mm. elevating discussion true so uh, when we talk about when we talk about this discussion you know there might be certain amount of geographical issues also india is mm. a highly populated country so yes. dr sanjay thakur was the, i think was the first person who started a mission or like organized structure and many of his were were in cities so yeah. uh, even from a perspective of organizing a new movement uh, at least initially a more uh, more community centered spirituality would be more easily organizable so maybe it is that over a period of time a tradition naturally evolves into giving space mm. into having some having space for people who need their own space while also uh, while also having those who can work with the organization and be be in its you could say maybe in its center in a literal sense or a physical sense uh 
Yes, I think both are needed. Like yeah, uh, definitely. So, uh, so I'm not suge- suggesting at all to close down the ashrams or community-based programs. Just that uh, there could be me- there could be so many other programs. There probably are. Uh, oh, even in fact, I know there are many other kinds of programs. But uh, because there are so many many kinds of di- different people, and uh, everyone should, in my opinion, at least, to have a chance to practice spirituality approach, uh, Krishna, develop bhakti in whatever way is most suitable for them rather than trying to fit everyone in the same pattern. So, uh, yeah. Mm, so true. And uh, so that means, uh, so what does this mean practically that such people may not want to say come for a regular Sunday program, may not want to come for a regular morning program, may themselves be serious spiritually, but they may not mm. be they may not be serious in terms of what might be considered or what are often considered as uh, parameters of spiritual seriousness or spiritual commitment. (laughs) Well, if social visibility uh, is considered the parameter, then not. Uh, But, uh, okay, one of the things I came across when I was doing my thesis was... uh, because I was studying uh, non-religiousness, people who are non-religious, uh, who are even opposed to religion in an organized setting. And then I read a, a lot of literature uh, on that, uh, atheistic arguments and then counter arguments. So one of the points that is coming across from the atheistic side is that uh, religion is related to being judgmental towards those who don't belong to your group, okay? And sometimes in the extreme cases, even leading to violent encounters between uh, those who believe differently and so on. So uh, so this is the argument that, look, religion is the source of uh, judgment or at least is correlated with judgment. So meaning religion is bad. We need to get rid of it. <laughs> so then... There are good scholars who have taken this challenge seriously and see what social science actually teaches us on this topic. And it turns out that these two very different or basically two distinct orientations towards religion. And one is group based and one is uh, oriented towards individual piety. So one person could, in fact, be both. These are not mutually exclusive, but when we take large numbers of people, then it turns out that some people are more tilting to this side and others to this side. And uh, according to all the studies that have been done, there's no correlation uh, with judgmental attitudes for with uh, individual piety orientation. And it kind of makes sense. Because if your point is that your primary motivation for becoming religious or spiritual is to belong to a group, uh, then it, uh, to me, it makes perfect sense that then you feel your group is best. And those who belong to another group may challenge the safety or the position Mm -hmm. of your group. Okay. Whereas if somebody's identity and basic motivation is my private practice, then... uh, shouldn't really bother me or him or her what the other person is doing because it's not about to which group I belong. So you are saying in one sense encouraging a a, a spirituality which is not so group identity or group centered can also Mm. decrease uh, you could say intergroup conflicts or intergroup prejudices. When you said there is no correlation means, but then the, no correlation between what? So if Yeah, so uh, th- there is a correlation. If spirituality is primarily based on group belonging, then there's a correlation with judgmental attitudes towards those oh, who don't belong okay, to okay. the group. That, 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 okay. that makes common sense in one. That makes obvious sense. Yeah. 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 Okay, okay. 
So, so it's a common sense point, but uh, the, the atheistic argument is that all religion is bad. And then the need arises, hey, let's make a distinction. There are different kinds of religi religiosities and spiritualities. True. And they are not all the same. Yeah, so now, uh, so even those who are what you're saying that um, individual piety and group group pi piety, is this more or less similar to the frame of introverts and extroverts? That I think uh, I'm the first person to talk about them, or is it something dif uh, different? Uh, it would be tempting to look at it from that point of view, but uh, I I have to say I don't know. Uh, I don't know if they are related or not. Since uh, why I'm raising this doubt is because I know many people who have very serious personal sadhana and who are not into belonging to a group, but they don't come across as very introvert at all. They could be very outgoing, but still valuing their personal independence and their primary practice is very private. So uh, truth be told, I, I don't know the answer to this question. Okay. It, uh, it would be something which would certainly be interesting to spend 10 years studying full time. <laughs> Oh God. <laughs> okay. So it's not so, so introversion and extroversion are more related with how we relate with people or how many people can we relate with introverts. They, yeah. they also like people, but they want the idea is they want people to interact with people in moderation hmm? mm. and with some interruption, with some space in between, whereas extroverts yeah. want to interact more and more with people. So that frame is more in terms of interaction with people, whereas this you are saying is more in terms of uh, spiritual practice per se. Yes. So it need not be in terms of uh, the way people interact with uh, each other, with others. Mm. No, exactly. It's how you view spirituality. So. Uh... I don't know if you have heard about this uh, distinction between extrinsic and intrinsic religiosity. But okay. extrinsic yeah. religiosity means that uh, you are interested in religion because of the things that it provides. It provides you friends, maybe safety, maybe you get food, whatever. M maybe you get social position because of being religious. Doesn't mean that you are not you don't have a spiritual interest, but it just seems that the other things are more important. So you are basically doing religion because of the other things that it gives you. So that's in extrinsic religiosity. So intrinsic is uh, the opposite of that. Like you are doing religion or spiritually for its own sake, because you want to find God. You want to realize yourself. You want to do the right thing no matter what. Uh, and uh, you want to follow the sacred text because they are sacred, not because if I behave in this way, then I get appreciation from others. Okay, so when we keep this distinction in mind, that it's possible to approach spiritual and religion from extrinsic reasons and intrinsic reasons, then a group based orientation would be more like uh, related to the extrinsic. Hmm. Now, you know, this seems to go into an uncomfortable zone because yeah. uh, we say that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came to teach Sankirtan and he yeah. actually himself went and encouraged others to go out and dance in public. So within this categorization, would that be called as extrinsic spirituality? Of course, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also had very pers intense personal sadhana as we see no. in his uh, Antelila especially. So, but it does seem uh, extre external, externally manifesting one spirituality seems to be a significant part of our tradition. Yes, and uh, I would never say that Sankirtan, you know, congregationally chanting the holy names would be extrinsic. <laughs> uh, that's the most intrinsic thing uh, 
in existence i think that's uh the deepest level of uh <laughs> establishing communion between the individual soul and the supreme uh my point was that if you are doing sankirtan primarily because you think you get social points out of it that's what i'm talking about i'm not talking about okay. uh participating in kirtan per se but why you are doing it so the why the extrinsic reason would be that the primary reason for you to go to a kirtan and sing together with others is not because you like kirtan and you it's not because you like glorifying the supreme lord together with others but because you feel uh, that this is my way of getting the sense of belonging and acceptance from others you see the difference you could do basically the same thing you could do your private practice or you could do a group based practice but your the reasons for you to do it could be totally different in both cases hmm. so this brings me back uh, to I'm my experience come back, to come back to this point you know so i appreciate okay. the extrinsic and intrinsic uh, spirituality are we definitely would like to go to our intrinsic spirituality in fact these words the very way the words are phrased is that we don't need extrinsic self worth we should cultivate intrinsic self worth so intrinsic is generally better but uh, i am uncomfortable with the implication that uh, say a community based spirituality is intrinsically extrinsic if i may put it that way so i don't <laughs> so That's i don't think something. that is your implication isn't it no it's not okay uh, uh i'm just my perception is people have different kinds of needs and uh it seems to me that uh uh doesn't matter what your primary like so called material needs are then uh those can be dovetailed in spirituality so um i find it yeah. fascinating that in bhagavad bhagavad gita the one chapter which is mostly focus on really the most private kind of practice namely the sixth chapter uh which is talking talking about the uh, ashtanga yoga Hmm. So that's the chapter where you find verses 16 and 17 which uh, seem to be talking about that one cannot be successful in this very private and uh, uh, personal project without taking into full consideration all of one's uh, so-called material needs. Okay so it's interesting so normally that verse is used to talk about regulating our needs but uh, what you are saying is that it also includes not too little and not too much yeah. so in that yeah, sense like it... too, too little too little would be that i have a sense of belonging to a group and if i totally neglect that in the name of spiritual let's some yoga books and they tell me that i should live alone in a cave and what if i have real need for social interaction <laughs> so uh, then that that would be too little for that person hmm makes sense so so now is there any analysis of the demographic um is it like 50 50% as both or is it in general people who want uh, who want uh, a community based spirituality are relatively larger in number and people who are individual based spirituality what are the words you use shorthand words for these two um i think i used a uh, group oriented contra personal piety oriented group oriented versus personal piety oriented when you yeah. use the word piety you are using that not in the sense of uh, religious piety are using it in the sense of uh, personal practice personal practice okay so, yeah so uh, we have uh, i have to say that these studies are primarily done uh with abrahamic religions so uh, it would be interesting to see how how it works with hinduism and buddhism 
and Taoism. Uh, but uh, the point is valid because the argument is also raised. This uh, Wait, new Metro, atheistic sorry, argument sorry, is raised. With, yeah. When you say these studies, are you referring to any particular studies or and the studies which talk about people having these two kind of natures? Is that what you're talking about? Uh, I was talking about uh, the response to the atheistic argument that religion seems to automatically correlate or mean that one is judgmental towards those who don't belong to one's group. Okay. And uh, then that argument is raised within a conversation which is primarily based on religion and theism means Abrahamic religion, Abrahamic theism. It's not always spelled out that clearly, but when you read the books of the new atheist authors like Dawkins and Hitchens and Sam Harris, by the way, I'm not recommending anyone to read them, but if you, <laughs> if you happen to have that kind of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that kind of interest which I had because I was doing my PhD on, on, on that field. Uh, then it seems that very much the argumentation is based on what's wrong with Christianity and Islam and Judaism. And even though it's oftentimes framed as all religion, but when you study in depth the arguments, uh, it nearly always seems like the uh, basic uh, specimen what what it means to be religious is uh, Christianity and Islam primarily so uh, when the argument that religion is correlated with judgmental attitudes and what to speak of violent behavior then I think it's defensible that the response to that comes by studying the same uh, Abrahamic religions and, and in that setting, it turns out that you can separate these two distinctly different kind of approaches towards being religious. So one person, the personal piety would mean that for that person, how religion is manifest is one is spending a lot of time in prayer, maybe reading Bible or Quran and stuff like that. And for the other person, I'm a little bit exaggerating now, but it would mean something like uh, uh, going to the church on Sunday because everyone else is there. Oh, okay. True. So you could also say that uh, even within the... I've studied a little bit of Christianity and the, within Christianity also there is a little bit of a mystic tradition of people who, the mystic sages, the desert masters. And so they- Yeah, it has that side. Hmm. Sorry? Yes, it has that side. Yeah, it has that side. Definitely. So, so yeah. it does seem that uh, there has throughout history across traditions, there have been some people who have practiced spirituality more in isolation. Yes. And uh, so of, isn't it to some extent natural for an organization to, mm. to cater more to those who need the organization. In yes, sense, of course. It's totally natural. So then that would mean that uh, all that we can do as that naturally those who want a group kind of spirituality, they will be the people who would be uh, who would even want to like grow up in positions of institutional leadership and they would want to be visible. It could be because of intrinsic spirituality also. It doesn't have to be extrinsic. But yeah. what could be done is that those who feel the need for, for practicing a more secluded kind of spirituality, they shouldn't mm. be made to feel guilty. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, And also, I, I, the argument should go both ways, that because I can so, sometimes I can see also the opposite phenomenon in the yoga world, that everyone is doing their own practice, and then they are coming together and together saying how they are not into organized religion and uh, how, how bad it is and how bad they experience with it were. And then I would like to add as a scholar of religion that but 
you know what? It's very good for some people. Some people really feel nourished in that kind of environment. So just the fact that you are not into it doesn't mean that it's not good for anyone. Superb. But yeah, good point. Very good point. You know, it's it, this is one of the challenges of being liberal. That sometimes those people who are liberal are very illiberal toward those who are not liberal. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So they, I, I want, I, I am going to be non-judgmental, and I become very judgmental toward anyone who is non, not non-judgmental. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's a, that's a very it's good balancing a... point. Yeah, and if we consider even from the point of your history, the religion as a social phenomena, we didn't have survived if it had not nourished people in some way. It so the very yeah. fact that as when I'm not talking about religion, I'm talking about as a, as a group phenomena. so whether mm-hmm. it is the huge cathedrals in in krish in, in catholicism in christendom or whether the temples and the holy places in india they survived because of because they was providing some nourishment to people oh definitely and uh, most of all i think it nourishes the soul and when the soul gets nourished then one tends to feel good about doesn't matter how you interpret it you might interpret it oh i just saw a very beautiful <laughs> religious building or i i heard a very beautiful religious song and even a totally like uh, atheistic or agnostic person might appreciate those experiences uh, but what about if it's a case that the reason for feeling nourished is because it nourishes one on the deepest possible level so uh, I find it fascinating because in my study uh, I studied non-religious uh, activists people who are into organizations who take the public role of criticizing or taking criti- critical stance towards the position of religion in society so uh, amongst those people I could find very di- different orientations just as amongst religious people we can find different uh, orientations so i've wanted to find out whether it's possible to find something similar uh, amongst those who reject religion and sure enough uh, one of the main three groups that i discovered was what i call experientially spiritual non-religious <laughs> people which is like on in terms of beliefs they tend to reject uh religious beliefs at least those that they know okay. of which means basically christianity uh so um despite that i spoke to many people who re- uh recounted very nourishing like inspiring experiences in a religious setting like being in church hearing religious music uh admiring the architecture uh doing meditation doing yoga uh just that this intellectual framework that's what we are going to reject but experientially it seems to be okay <laughs> whereas then there are other non religious who just reject everything they are not into experiences it's all bad but <laughs> there's a segment which uh quite much into the experience experiential side to it and which just makes me think that uh <laughs> maybe it's because uh, the self somehow gets nourished in the deepest possible level mm-hmm. anyway it's that's uh, amazing that's a, you know just a thought. i i saw once i lived through and didn't read the whole book i saw in the airport a book called religion for atheists so the premise of that book was that religion provides certain psychological and emotional supports and even social social supports that uh, that atheism itself can't provide so in that sense yeah. in one sense and actually if you look at history also in the french revolution happened french revolution was mm. not just political it was aggressively atheistic also but then they created yeah. i think a temple to the reason notre dame they replaced <laughs> it and they made it into so they in one sense replicated the rituals even i think yeah. in commun- communism they would make statues of lenin and they had so many statues which were eventually melted away when and used as yes. metal after communism fell yeah there are today there are not many but there are some uh 
atheist Sunday services where people oh, really? congregate and sing okay. songs together. Can, kind of, can we have the good things of religion without religion <laughs> kind of thing? It's fascinating. It's a very real need. So uh, that's that's one point which I find also interesting. Like, okay, if anyone says that here's a list of things where we can say that religion is bad, then it's a uh, okay. But then you cannot disregard the list where religion is good. Uh, as uh, tends to be very one-sided when somebody's raising this kind of critical point. So it, it's true. Religion, mm. religiosity uh, brings many benefits. And so <laughs> sometimes it, one could argue it's good to be religious, even if you don't want to be religious uh, in many ways, just yeah. because of the material benefits that it provides. Uh, you know, there is anyway, a book, people... I just, I just to come back to this, just to uh, reinforce this point, there is a book called Handbook of Religion and Health, which okay. uh, I think it was published by Cambridge, and uh, uh, they have... Uh, they have documented about 3,000 3, st published studies across the world. It is a mega, what they call meta study, compilation of these all these studies. And they yeah. talk about physical health parameters and religious affiliation, not affiliation, but commitment. Like not just somebody says, I'm a Christian, but they go to a church. So yeah. every week or something like that. And physical yeah. health parameters and mental health parameters. And they found a remarkably positive correlation that uh, those who were religiously committed, they would uh, they suffer less from depression and stress and suicidal urges and addiction, and even mm. less chances of heart attacks, faster recovery from strokes and heart attacks. And overall, it seemed that they lived about 11 years longer than their atheist counterparts. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's so, so, so that author... I think I, I read this book in, I read this book, so one of the authors who quotes this, Patrick Glenn, in, uh, he says that if as Sigmund Freud is said that it, that religion is a, is an illusion, then it is an illusion we should all desire to be just for the sake of our physical and emotional health, mental health. Yeah. So that's interesting. Just going back to your another point before you move ahead, that, uh, so that somebody may be rationally very averse to religion, but experientially yeah. they may drawn, be drawn to its forms. Hmm? Exper yes. That's what you said. So this also made yes. me, this also actually has resonated with me that, that sometimes we overemphasize people's uh, intellectual conceptions or even their beliefs because yeah, people exactly. are multidimensional. And yes. say, we might say this person is a Mayavadi, this person is a, but so they might have just some impersonal ideas, but that is not the core of their spirituality. They may just yeah. be as happy in a Krishna temple as they might be in an Advaitic meditation center. And happy means they actually feel some spiritual connect. So, yeah. so I had thought of this in terms of ideological conceptions, but it can go further even in terms of uh, beliefs. Yeah. Of so, so so then what to speak of, uh, so the whole idea is we cannot reduce spirituality to any one parameter. It, it need not be ideological, no. intellectual conceptions, it need not be beliefs, and it certainly need not be one's, uh, one's uh, attraction or one's, uh, one's presence or absence in, say, communal settings. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Uh... Spirituality is definitely multidimensional, and even if you want to study it sociologically, then to limit it into only the domain of beliefs doesn't do justice to it at all. So uh, one should minimally consider at least uh, the beliefs, but then also practice, meaning what one actually does, and then third, belonging. So who one is hanging out with, if one is formally affiliated in a group, or uh, even if you're not formally affiliated, but in a survey, you would say, okay, but I'm Hindu and or I'm Muslim. So that you have an identity. So um, 
all of these are part of spirituality, but they are different dimensions. So sometimes, particularly when we are talking about conversion, I don't know why is it so important to emphasize the conversion. Uh, I, I suspect it has something to do with uh, Christian emphasis, and is, Islam is also a, a emphasis on conversion, that you need to have the right kind of beliefs and ideas so that you are a true Christian or true uh, whatever. Uh, but then when we consider South Asian spirituality, well, at least it seems to me that it's much more about what one does and uh, i'm not saying beliefs are not important they are uh, but they are not they don't tell the whole story and particularly when we are talking about like uh, uh, trans, trans transformation deep transformation in one, in our world views then these are these are very demanding processes so the intellect, intellectual part of us could really be the <laughs> last part of us that gets it wow everything wow. else is already transformed i'm already doing this practice i'm already hanging out with these people i'm already eating prasadam and then finally the buddha realizes wait a minute i'm in the process of becoming a devotee of krishna <laughs> It, it could be that way, and if that is the case, then I don't really see a point for a person like that to emphasize that first you need to, you know, uh, verbalize your commitment before you can do anything else. Verbalize your commitment, yeah, that's a good way of putting it. And so, in general, if you see, Hinduism is... Uh, uh, Hinduism, if you look at it from a historical perspective, it was quite uh, decentralized or diffused. Now, there is mm. no one founder, there is no one sacred text that is accepted by everyone. There is no yeah. one historical date from which it can be, it can be set to begin. So, yeah. in that sense, so we are not, we are, when you are talking about conversion, we are talking more in terms of uh, verb externalized or verbalized profession of one's faith. Hmm? Yeah. So that is not. Uh, so, like so, yeah. yeah. So you talk about three components. One is one's beliefs, one's practices. And what was the third thing you said? Uh, third was? Be belonging. The social component. Also, oh, you are differentiating practices from belonging. Yes. Okay. Okay. I, I think, yeah, that's true. So, so in our context, we could say we study the Bhagavad Gita and we accept the teachings of the Gita, practice the chanting. Yeah. The belonging is say we go regularly for the Sunday programs or whatever, like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You see, uh, uh, when we study country-wise how spirituality and religion takes place in different countries. Hmm. So I live in Sweden now, and. Uh, According to some studies, this is the least one of the least, least religious countries in the world. Because when you go out and interview people and what are your beliefs, and it turns out that uh, the first thing you hear is not exactly uh, what is uh, written in the Bible. But at the same time, more than 50% of the population are members of the Church of Sweden. So my question is, what do you make out of that? Why are they members of the church if they don't believe in any of its teachings? So uh, the point being that in Sweden, if you only analyze religiosity in terms of beliefs and disregard the perhaps equally important sense of belonging, and it turns out that more than half the people population still feels it's important to belong to the predominant religious institution in the country, so it's a. Uh, it leaves out a very important component of the picture. So let me re, re articulate what you said. Is that so? So if people are asked about their personal beliefs, a large number yeah. of people may say that they are atheist. But more than fifty percent people, they say they are affiliated with the church, or they actually go to the church. What that belonging? How how do we quantify or assess that belonging? 
Oh, it's a it's a formal membership. Oh, so the the formal membership. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's interesting. So, uh, I, I'm not saying that. I don't. Th- it's going too far to say that half of the Swedes are atheists, uh, because atheism to be an atheist that's also a question of identity. So there are quite a most people who don't believe in God don't want to identify as atheists because really? they think it's as, as an identity tag it's too heavy, too negative or something. Oh really? Even now, in, even in the Western world also? Yes. Oh okay. Uh, so basically, in you, you can go to any place and study how many people don't believe in God. That number is much bigger than those who say I am an atheist. <laughs> okay. So that and, is that is because uh, people fear that atheists will be judged and persecuted, or is it just that uh, I also heard this that nowadays there is this tendency for people called nuns that I don't want I don't want to be identified with the religion, but I don't want to be identified with atheism also. That yeah, I, that, I think the another word used for this was apathism that I just don't care for all this business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good word. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, interesting. By the way, interestingly enough, then there's always a small percentage of atheists who do believe in God. Really? Yeah. And why would they call themselves atheists then? Uh, probably because they want to differentiate themselves from the me- predominant form of religion in that society. So I don't believe in that God, but. I believe in some kind of impersonal divinity or something like that. It's oh. a small percentage, but it is it is there. It's uh, discovered every time when you study the group of people who self-identify as atheists, then what it means to them not to believe in God usually means a very specific kind of God, but not ne- for for most of them it does mean that no gods, but for some it means that they are rejecting a part, part, particular conception, but not not necessarily all of them. Mm. So once you go, once we go from this tac- broad taxonomical categories down to individual mm. psychologies, it, things become quite uh, we could say either puzzlingly complex or fascinatingly complex. <laughs> yeah, people yeah. are really fascinating and complex entities. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Mm. So now, so basically, till now we discussed about this, uh, this aspect of the group and individual, and yeah. uh, I feel that even within our movement, slowly, at least there are some people who are recognizing that uh, that you know those who want their own space. It's not if somebody doesn't come to the temple every that doesn't mean that they've fallen in Maya. If somebody doesn't, mm. uh, so it's it's also that recognition is gradually coming. So I would say there are some healthy changes happening. And mm. do you see that happening uh, in your part of the ISKCON world also, or it's a, it's a slow process? Uh, <laughs> uh, the particular place uh, I live in, Alvik uh, village. Uh, it's a village of devotees and this is i don't know this is a particularly wonderful place uh so uh here the mood is very accepting and uh welcoming and accommodating so i don't know if it's representative of <laughs> oh okay that's nice of this that's corner okay. of the world at large yeah happy to hear this yeah so now, so are there any other categories also that uh, are these kind of nuanced uh, factors that may affect people's receptivity towards bhakti spirituality? One is, of course, the group and individual orientations. Yes. Uh, are there any other factors so, that you also observed? Yes. Uh, one thing that I observed is... Uh, I mean, I observed it first without really understanding what's going on. But later on, when I studied the sociology of religion, I discovered a possible explanation. So one one uh, one interesting uh, 
distinction is distinction between material and post material values so material values material means and post material that's yeah. fascinating so, so uh, when, when are you the same as spiritual or what does it mean post material this is not yeah, a very common elaborate. word i heard yeah go ahead please yeah so first with values here when i'm talking about values in terms of uh, soci- social psychological uh, <clears throat> motivating uh, factors i'm not really saying i'm not really speaking about what people might verbalize that my value is uh, this or that but they are more like uh, on the subconscious level felt uh, needs so material values would mean that material things are important one has a need for safety a need for regular employment and uh, need for economical stability stuff like that now who doesn't the thing is here that uh, once those needs are satisfied meaning if one grew up in a sa- safe environment uh, with uh, i'm not saying necessarily wealthy but your needs basic basic needs were fulfilled you had clothes you had food uh, you had enough of everything then uh, that opens the door for emphasizing something else being interested in something else as a primary thing in your life so it seems like when we are talking about large groups of people on the individual level anything could happen but uh, when we are talking about like on society level then it seems like um, as long as there's a lack in terms of basic material necessities then that will be the primary focus so uh okay. western western world has undergone undergone what's uh, sometimes called a silent revolution it's silent because nobody started screaming and shouting there was intergenerational change in values so after the war after the second world war, war uh, material values were predominant but when those people grew up and started families and were economically well off their children grew up in a totally different kind of environment where the basic needs were already like that was not an issue which means that they are much more into this uh, self exploration finding one's own what is important for me rather than first thinking where will i get food into the table so post material doesn't necessarily mean spiritual it just means that you are not primarily concerned about uh, your material necessities fascinating and i also read about this that nowadays when people look for jobs especially in the western world they're not just looking to get the highest paying job they also want to look yeah. at what will make it what will give me job satisfaction what will help me yeah, to do exactly. something meaningful in life that's an indicator of post material yeah. values yes <laughs> besides i would say it's also an indicator that varna samadharma is a correct perception of reality because one part of it is one will be happy when one one is acting according to one's nature and studies show that uh, it's really bad for mental health to be unemployed because you are not fulfilling your need to do something meaningful but even worse than that is to do a work which you hate so it means that uh, oh, really? uh, even if you get yeah so i, I didn't even know this. I, I, my general understanding was that say the idle mind is a devil's workshop so better do something than nothing yeah. but what you're saying is yeah. that especially if your job you hate that's worse yeah. than no job is it uh, yeah the point point being that of course if if the option is that i'm going hungry then it's obviously better to do something which you don't necessarily like in order to get food into your table but okay. once the basic okay. needs are met then after a certain point getting like 10 times more salary will not be enough to compensate the fact that you are doing something which you don't love wow yeah you know you can also see that when 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 i also interact with people you can see some people are passionate about their professions not passionate in the rajasic yeah. kind of way passionate in the sense that they yeah. love what they're doing and there yeah. are some people for them it's okay they don't hate it but it's just their chore for them it's just like another thing it's a thing i have to do in my life yeah. so 
so we could say that somebody who is passionate about their profession they they have been fortunate enough to find a profession that broadly aligns with their swadharma exactly that's how i tend to look at it it's a very fortunate situation and it's very unfortunate if it turns the other way around that you are constantly doing something which is totally at odds with your own nature okay so that that But, could also be one reason say why by say a traditional christian spirituality which to some extent was fear based that yeah. you know, that you god will punish you if you don't obey him right so, or god will provide you if you obey him that yeah. whole fear desire kind of thing that will become irrelevant because uh, yeah that that is not that is no longer the primary concern of people yeah exactly so uh, when the focus is on fulfilling material values then it makes sense to promote religion that this is a means to get rid of suffering or this is an this is a good way of generating wealth so krishna is listing four kinds of people who approach him so <laughs> one way of reading it there could be a dividing line between material and post material values in that list really yeah. artho and artharthi that is stressed on the needy they are material and the yeah. inquisitive and the uh, intellectual the gyanis the jigyasa and the gyanis are beautiful so it, it's not the one to one match but of course, just of course. I, i'm just throwing this idea that at least as long as you're primarily doing religion and spirituality because you are suffering then that's definitely a, like in, in the realm of material values hmm So the point coming back to uh, outreach and how to present uh, spiritual the Krishna consciousness bhakti uh, to new people then i find this is very important to take into consideration so if you are speaking to an audience who is primarily interested in post material values and all of your speech is about that this is the only way of getting rid of suffering then people are what's he talking about because i'm not suffering and then you try to make an argument you just don't see it you are suffering and why not emphasize that spiritual life can be an adventure because that's what uh, suppose the person or the audience is primarily interested in finding something exciting in life because the basic material needs are fulfilled that's amazing so you could say that in the at one level the world is always dukkhalaya Uh, but yeah. that doesn't necessarily mean that the dukha is equally evident for everyone and is equal in the same forms so for somebody who is starving or who is worried about the next meal or is worried about the next say political attack which may devastate their village or their country so yeah. for them it's a very different category of uh, experience than for somebody who is living in a yeah. peaceful environment with a good job with a good family yeah is yeah because in one case it's extremely extremely tangible and in another case it's much more subtle so for somebody who is uh, basically materially happy then the argument could be raised that when we are when we are talking about suffering that this material world is a place of suffering then one is to explain that there are different kinds of suffering and happiness is another kind of suffering because material happiness is temporary and is much less intense than a spiritual happiness sure okay true it could also be said that at that stage at, at the stage of post material values a person's primary priority um, may not simply be uh, we could say or we could tell them their concern is not so much of avoiding misery but then they may be mm. seeking pleasure but there could be levels of pleasure there could be more meaningful yeah. pleasures more as you said yeah. adventurous pleasures and yeah, yeah you know in new zealand i gave a class and there uh, there i one of the concluding sentences i spoke is that uh, that you know if we pull ourselves together our mind and senses are pulling us all in different directions it just spontaneously yeah. came out way if we could all put 
if we could put our mind and senses together and focus on one thing hmm, then there is just imagine how much more we can achieve in life how much better we can become and yeah. discovering that discovering what all how how good we can become how much good we can do by putting ourselves together that could be our life's greatest adventure and yeah. as i said several people came after that and spoke said, that was the most memorable part of the talk for them so i never thought about it that way yeah in one sense from a material perspective new zealand is considered to be a reasonably comfortable country i think that applies to most of the western world so yeah so telling them that the dukhalam and even telling them emphasizing you are not the body or the soul it just doesn't resonate so much so oh, it's beautiful so so again are you saying that uh, iskon's presentation of bhakti spirituality is more for people with material values not post material values because prabhupad's first candidates or first people who got attracted to hippies I think they would be the quintessential yeah. quintessential example of people driven by post material values isn't it yes <laughs> correct so uh, yeah please so then is our presentation already not geared for toward them or how did prabhupad's presentation attract them if it was not geared for post material values uh well uh i'm not i think i said before that uh, whenever i read uh, whatever shri prabhupada wrote i find all sorts of uh, messages like re- really like cap- capturing uh, the attention uh, in very many different ways doesn't almost doesn't matter what you are interested in there's something for you so uh uh but uh to me it seems that uh one of the examples that we could learn from him is the ability to go to a foreign different environment and make a presentation and sometimes so- somehow make it in a way that captures the attention of that particular audience in a way that works so all i'm saying is that uh, whoever is doing outreach Uh, needs to consider the audience what kind of audience it is so mm. uh, that's beautiful. i would I, i would really not want to make a general statement about the style of outreach how iskon is doing is because i don't really know <laughs> i have seen oh. only a very li- limited part of it that is but I, i think i think that's you, a fairly you know, good point let's focus on not what we are doing are right or wrong but we could focus more on what in one sense we could do to best reach the audience that exists right now in the world yes so so, uh, so one point i, I had about, one yeah, just yes. one, conclude one point you made about reaching post material pe- post people with post material values uh, yeah. is that we don't uh, focus on material misery so much or the miserable nature of the world as on the yeah. adventurous or exploratory nature of spirituality yes so uh, we can get into into specifics about what kind of things we are talking about when we are talking about post material values so let me list just a few so one thing is uh, stimulation uh, so you want to have an exciting life Then there's another one uh which is uh, about self direction uh one is very like the need for autonomy as you put it can then be related to action i want to do my own thing independently or autonomy of thought it's very important for one to develop one's own ideas then you have the whole universalism uh, segment it's very important for one to be tolerant towards others even they, if they have a different viewpoint another, another one would be concern for nature uh so there are all sorts of things which fall within the realm of uh, post material uh, values in other words when you are no longer primarily concerned about how will i survive 
the next year. Uh, then it turns out that uh, there are quite a few things which could be interesting. So emphasizing the spiritual life as an adventure would probably be the right thing to do for somebody who is into stimula stimulation that is looking for an exciting life. But then you could have a, like a more Brahminical kind of person who is into the into intellectual uh, work and uh, like a philosopher type. And then you could just give a class on Upanishads. My God, you know, one thing struck me as you're, as you're speaking, that this could be an entirely unexplored dimension of service attitude. If we are really serving our audience, that serving our audience begins with, uh, or one, not begins with, or one important part of serving our audience is to understand what their needs are, and then find out which aspect of Krishna consciousness will serve their particular needs. If you yeah. just consider Krishna consciousness like a one zero package, Krishna consciousness yeah. means here classes, come to that morning program, distribute books, go on Harinam, and we present the whole package. Some people may be very comfortable with one aspect of the package and yeah. may be very uncomfortable with another aspect of the package. Exactly. And the good, good news is whatever I have seen, like, uh, bhakti yoga as it takes uh, as it's presented in the form of Krishna consciousness what I've, I have seen nothing compares to that it's really like one stop shopping uh, solution I mean there's nothing in the realm of spiritual life that you cannot address uh, and but while all the while fully following the tradition just well, consider the philosophy, it's so broad. It's, uh, I haven't seen anything like that anywhere else. Oh, so you're saying that actually we have a one-stop solution. That, yeah. uh, so it, it, you could say it is not a, a one-size-fit-all solution, but it can no. be a one-stop solution. Yeah, I, I, I would like to see it as a, like a huge shopping center with a, like, Seven, eight billion different shops so every person has their own personal <laughs> shop but it's they are all owned by krishna beautiful mm -hmm. so I, I i'm i'm not saying i'm not suggesting my idea is not that we should uh, or anyone should like trying to make compromise that it's okay to sustain your material desires forever <laughs> but just to uh, that i think there are two points one is to just how to capture the attention and it to second is the basic psychophysical nature of its if it changes it changes really slowly so the underlying psychological motivational uh, profiles that we have this tend to change really slowly. So it's, it's not really constructive to try, try to change the person to fit into an existing program if it's not a match, but rather keep that program, but create another one for that profile. Mm. And this would, it would be significantly challenging if we are very organized and institutionalized. So it would mean, it could also mean we may need smaller communities or smaller groups of devotees coming together where people get to know each other better and you can have more custom fit things for people. Mm. So, and this could go on in parallel with, with big temples and huge programs because that also serves a need for some people. But yes. forcing everyone to fit into a profile and saying that if somebody doesn't fit into that profile, that then they have no making them feel guilty and then practically making them go away from Krishna. That is not at all essential. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. You know, just uh, going back a little bit, uh, you said that uh, people who are uh, at almost diverse philosophical need, diverse personal needs could be fulfilled. And then you made this point about worldly desires. So when you talk about post-material, it is not that people with post-material, uh, they don't 
it's not that they don't have material desires it is just that uh, concern with material needs does not dominate their minds or that does not primarily determine their life decisions yeah they have different kinds of material needs okay yeah in one sense so they may or may not be uh involved in what what in this can we call a sense gratification that independent of that so that might be a significant part of their lives but that is not yeah. what drives them primarily no uh, and it seems to me that when you consider these underlying psychological profiles everything can be expressed within the three modes so for instance you could be security oriented like conforming to group norms feeling safe having the basic needs fulfilled that could be your primary issue but you could still do it in a perfectly sattvic way and integrate that into a like full dose of spiritual life but then another person who is more like post <laughs> materially oriented that person could totally do it in a very tamasic way let me seek stimulation and fill in the blanks and uh <clears throat> or like you could you could seek stimulation in a very tamasic way or in a very sattvic way or rajasic way beautiful so, so, same thing when we consider about the autonomy of thinking so i i suspect why it may have a bad taste in certain spiritual circles why it's considered a problem is because it can be expressed in so many different ways but uh, when i look at the tradition of gaudiya vaishnavism it seems to me that if you take tradition and scripture seriously then it turns out there's just so much and so many acharya so many teachers giving different viewpoints on the same topic sometimes uh, disagreeing with one another uh, in a harmonious way that uh, <clears throat> you could just uh, totally get into the world of uh, developing your independent thought all the while fully following the tradition as well and being totally sattvic and spiritual in all sorts of ways but then another person might also have the need for autonomous thinking and then just direct that <laughs> into i don't know what like how to commit crime very creatively uh, Oh okay. This is interesting. It's almost like when when we talk about a psychophysical nature you, you can almost say that there are two layers to it. There is one layer is uh, is like the set of tools we get. Yeah. By by as you said in the beginning our past samskaras and everything by past karma. Yes. And the second is the 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 disposition by which we use those tools yes so so in one sense you could we may not call such a person kshatriya but a kshatriya a kshatriya could also be in the mode of ignorance where a person is very <laughs> violent brutal so yeah. technically may not be a kshatriya but say hitler was a kshatriya but he was completely in tamoguna so yeah. so on the, now now i don't know we could, we could call a brahmana in tamoguna an intellectual who goes about rationalizing sense gratification and rationalizing anti spiritual values we might say yeah. that there is an aspect of there which is tamasic yeah they are teaching tamasic teaching they are, they are spreading tamasic values and tamasic teachings yeah it's fascinating so what do you think about jaras and her good example imprisoning so many kings and planning to slaughter them to gain yeah. power that's clearly tamasic that really sounds like uh, not the, not the sattvic kind of thing you would do in prison <laughs> 20000 kings and then plan to <laughs> perform the greatest human sacrifice in the history <laughs> true perfectly true so so that's what when i went to the universities in america i started going the first thing that struck to me and when i from a indian conservative brahmachari background is that uh many people were dressed in such uh, scanty clothes uh but after i 
after that initial shock or agitation subsided then as it struck me that in some ways i was more obsessed with their dress than they were with each other's dresses yeah it like it was just a part of their life and some people who i would think of oh, the by their very dress they seem to be so it is not just female alone male male female everyone i would yeah. think that they would be very sen- they would be they would be thinking of nothing except sense gratification but sometimes after the during the class or after the during the talk after the talk they would ask some of the most thoughtful questions yeah so in that sense uh, we cannot uh, presume so somebody might be involved in sense gratification as a, assuming based on the way they are dressing but even then they might be having questions about spirituality and they might be on a spiritual quest also yes so so and now are there uh, you talked about two three things you earlier to talk about tolerance about love for nature so are yeah. these what you are listing as post modern values or not not post material values post material yeah okay I shifted the framework now from uh, one scholar to another, but basically, yes. Okay. So, is there a list like that, or or what? What is relevant for us as devotees? I think love for nature we can very easily, uh, not very easily, but we can cater for it by talking about the environmental aspect of you know, Bhumi Devi and how our culture just focus on Krishna himself is a eco friendly god. He lives close to nature. So, yeah. I am in Goa, the eco village, where it's the major part of the appeal is the environmental friendly living. Yes, mm. exactly. Uh, but really, when I look at, uh, uh, it doesn't matter what profile one might have. I cannot really see that there wouldn't be a way to spiritualize that, to dedicate that into Krishna service. Mm. I mean, isn't that the central idea about? yukta vairagya using what one has rather than trying to deny what one has first Beautiful. i don't know maybe i'm totally lost but it seems to me that okay it it seems that some of the values are clearly more sattvic uh, by their nature and uh, uh, yes it's interesting but, now you're using the word yukta vairagya the term normally we talk of it in terms of external things you can use technology you can use cars and planes in krishna service but so you could have it... the yukta vairagya approach to even a personal character types or personal profiles and personal what would be the word endowments personal yeah. nature since mm. uh, since our mind and sanskaras they are just as much part of prakriti as a hammer or a computer beautiful yeah Isn't it? Just because they are internal to us doesn't make they they are still part of prakriti. Mm. Yeah, they are, they are not part of the soul. Ex- they are external to the self. Hmm. So, uh, if we explore this this dimension of serving people's needs, mm. or or or, yeah, uh, providing those aspects of of bhakti spirituality which address their needs. so do mm. we do we envision that uh, uh, people who connect this way will eventually adopt the full program or some people may never adopt that mm. yeah i think it doesn't matter what kind of presentation you have some people will adopt and more people will not adopt if you follow krishna statistics is like uh, how, how much is it like one one out of million who is yes. <laughs> who so, goes all the way so uh but the point is uh, as the way i see it is uh, uh the important task is to figure out how to help a particular pers- person take that person's next step rather than thinking that how i can help this person to go all the way within the next three years but focus on what's the next step for that person and help that person to take that that next step that's usually not so difficult to figure out mm true once we start focusing on on going all the way then they feel too pressured and yeah. we also feel disappointed if they're not going all the way yeah in one sense we 
you know, Bhakti Vinod Thakur at one place says that humility means to have no expectation from others. So yeah. that could be a that could be something which could apply in our outreach also. They don't yeah. expect too much from people. They say let them take their steps. The the teacher or the outreacher obviously needs to have the vision what it means to go all the way, so that you can always help wherever somebody is. You can always try to help to elevate that person from where that person is. And because people mm-hmm. are in different places in their spiritual evolution, then it. Uh, you can really offer the same recipe for everyone. Um, you know, I try to do some poetic, tra- uh, poetic or rhyming kind of translations of some Gita verses. I yeah. write on the Gita every day uh, on GitaDaily.com. So at 4.11 where Krishna says, yeah, as all people surrender to me, I reward them. Everybody is on my path. So I had phrased it as from your place, at your pace, access my grace. So, oh, that's beautiful. So, from your place, at your pace. But you know, I had just written it, but the and I had talked about how Krishna allows Himself to be accessible from for those who are karma yogis, for those who are jnana yogis, for ashtang yogis. In fact, Krishna yeah. in the Bhagavad Gita shows pathways for all of them to come to Him. He doesn't say that only bhakti yogis can come to Him. But what yeah. you have, to, what our discussion has revealed is that those pathways can actually expand far, far more in terms of reaching out to people. That that has been my perception, by the way, because uh, I've been teaching yoga and also part of that has been training teachers, people who want to start teaching. And uh, usually that group of people are much, much more receptive to philosophy and meditation and sattvic lifestyle than your general uh uh, general yogi so um, a few years ago i started then finally systematically teaching bhagavad gita previously i thought it's like uh, somehow i don't know i felt it's uh, maybe too difficult but then i took the challenge and uh, i have seen that it's really important because it's so easy to conceptualize spiritual practices it's something that is happening in a particular place, in a particular time. Maybe it's asana practice, or maybe it's a mantra meditation, whatever it is. But you just, uh, this is my spiritual practice, and what I do the rest of the time is something else. It just seems to me that Bhagavad Gita is all about answering that question. What, what should I do throughout the day? and even outside of my private spiritual practice. So it's, it's very important. And there are so many different, uh, different <laughs> approaches to different kinds of people. Okay. No, so I'm just trying to connect what you said. When you're re- reaching out to teachers, those are yoga teachers, you're teaching yoga especially. So you found yeah. that they were more, more interested and more receptive than the average, average even yoga practitioners to some extent. Was that what you're saying? Or uh, because I just didn't. Con- so you said one point was about you try to teach yoga, then you start teaching philosophy, you start teaching Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. So how yeah. do you connect that with compartmentalization? Yeah, I discovered that Bhagavad Gita is, as you said, it's so broad. It presents so many different tools. So so there are many kinds of d- different kinds of people, and the unifying mm-hmm. factor might be that they agree that it's important to have a daily spiritual practice. But what do you do outside of that to go? all the way in spiritual life requires that ultimately you need to fill in all all of your 24 hours a day and so bhagavad gita gives like almost unlimited at least 700 (laughs) different ideas about okay how to go about it that's beautiful does it make sense yeah yeah perfect in fact uh here we could put it this way that although in 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 in, Bhak- in Krishna consciousness, we do say that one should be always spiritual. And the idea was that, early, uh, previously the idea was that you move into the temple and 24 hours you will be spiritual because you will be always yeah. doing serving Krishna. But yeah. that is not practically possible or sustainable for most people. Yeah. And then if, if we want people who are living in the world to move towards a more, what would you more 
to be to be more constantly spiritual mm. uh, then we will have to in one sense expand the conception of spirituality for them it's not that we are expanding it's rather we will have to show them a more expansive conception of spirituality and that is there in the gita itself yes so arjuna is not a arjuna is not like a full time devotee living in the temple he is a person in the world he is very busy yeah. as a responsible king yeah i get the feeling that his one of his first arguments is that would it perhaps be better to be a full time devotee living in the temple and then krishna is saying no stay in the battlefield don't do that Oh that's beautiful that, that's true in one sense you know, the gita is categorically against world renunciation isn't it substance it is it is it doesn't it doesn't condemn the path of renunciation yeah. but it does categorically emphasize that that the path of engagement in the world is much more much more preferable yeah and you could also say that if you see in today's world even even monks are engaged with the world like i have on technology with you right now so yeah. so in one sense it's it's not so much about the paths but it's more about the the roles that we are playing according to our dispositions hmm yes yes bro so you know we have uh, it's been a very maybe one last question and then we can conclude Okay. so do you recommend uh, devotees to read some books to understand uh, the psychological profiles of different people or just interacting with them and just listening to them helps us understand where they are coming from and what they would need yeah uh, i would not recommend to anyone to get into the academic <laughs> study of sociology of religion uh it just happened to be my particular occupation and uh uh i found it interesting uh but uh, i think the basic ideas can be understood just by listening through this podcast and there's no need to dwell deeper into that at the same time i think it might be good if if some devotees who have that kind of inclination would specialize on that and they could then give consultation to others who don't have time and interest to spend weeks and months and years studying it but the basic ideas are quite simple and uh, i think uh, just by interacting with people on a regular basis one will notice what works and what what doesn't yeah so just uh, in one sense you could say that transforming our interaction with people from like talking to them instead of that talking with them yeah that itself having will help us understand yeah. them better yeah having a conversation learning to know the people and hearing what needs they have doesn't mean we have to uh say that yeah i have a need to be drunk every friday so you can hear it doesn't need you doesn't mean you have to <laughs> accept that that's a good thing but uh uh to hear and understand another person doesn't really work if you at the outset already start by first giving a two hour speech that this is what you need to understand before we can have a conversation okay that's true in one sense uh i met a devotee i was interacting with a devotee recently he is very inspired he's trying to research the one year prabhupad was in america before his con started oh and he wants to so there is a there is a prabhupad said at sali agarwal's place initially for one month and yeah. her reflections that go sali and gopal agarwal she said that swami ji was interested in everything american you know yeah. how the washing machine worked how the vacuum cleaner worked how we did this how we did that so that this jolly told me that i realized i was wondering why is prabhupad so interested in these things prabhupad didn't come from america to learn how come from india to america to learn how a vacuum cleaner works <laughs> <laughs> but his understanding was that prabhupad was trying to understand how american people think and function yeah and then he would be able to connect with them 
So yes. that's why he's saying that that one year, what Prabhupada did during that one year, if you could meet more people and talk with them and learn from them, it could actually infuse our outreach with a more of a learning mood than a teaching mood. Yeah. So, you know, that's what he's doing is echoing what you have shared over here. This is beautiful. So, should I uh, try to summarize what we discussed or would you like to add something concluding words before or after? Uh, no, I'm happy to hear your summary. Okay. So, today we discussed about broadly the topic of understanding people's needs to share spirituality effectively with them. And you talked about your experiences first as a spiritual seeker, then how you found bhakti or mantra chanting, which you tried to disprove and yeah. turned out to be the best, uh, most potent form of meditation for you. And then we lived in the ashram. Then you're, now you're a yoga teacher. You did your academic studies also in, religious, in sociology of religion. So based on that, we, I think we discussed two broad themes. One is mm-hmm. the group-oriented spirituality and more of personal piety. Yeah. That is the first broad theme. And people, there are people who fall, some people, they're just not comfortable with the group-oriented spirituality. And mm-hmm. they, they, they can be very serious. They can have strong spiritual sadhana, but uh, they would like to do it privately. Mm. And that doesn't necessarily mean they're introverts. It, it, they may want to be with people and they may be comfortable with people, but with respect to the spirituality, they, are, they want to be private. Mm. So it, it seems we look at it back in our traditions also that there are sages who lived in communal hermi- hermitages and others who lived alone. And then that connection, we also talk about the theme of independence, that some people need have a greater need for autonomy and others may have may not have that much of a need. So mm. Katha Upanishad, the, the question between the discussion there, that whether the teacher appreciates, oh, you're asking such, such good and tough questions that indicates an appreciation of, uh, we could say, independent thoughtfulness of mm. asking hard questions, not just accepting the authority for, uh, for everything from the authority. So within Bhakti, we have facility and usually the organization would be a facility for People who people whose need for autonomy is much lesser, mm. and uh, for the, you could say those who would not be comfortable with that situation, maybe a little bit on the borders of the organizational setup. And the, this often, from our spiritual perspective, philosophical perspective, understand this comes from the samskaras. So we yeah. all bring a particular kind of uh, psychological nature, we could say, orientation which may become manifest at a particular time, just like sexual desires. They are there in small children also, but they become manifest at puberty. So they may manifest at different times. And then with respect to this, rather than uh, saying that we need to change anything, but rather those who don't fit into the group oriented spirituality, that doesn't mean that they, that they should be made to feel guilty or rejected that they can be given their own space to practice also. And we talked about that somebody might be a part of group-oriented spirituality because their values are extrinsic. That means they want to increase by attending, like by being present at a social roll call. They want to get some social prestige, you could say, or at least social worth. So that might Mm. not be a very healthy motive for spirituality, but that doesn't mean that everybody who is doing that is seeking extrinsic. So Mm. you made this good point that there are atheists who may also be drawn to a religion as an experience. Mm. And so people are complex and they have multiple dimensions. And for some people, their, their intelligence may be the last part which comes towards spirituality. So they also can be given some pathways. And atheists who say all of religion is bad, all of religion fosters dependence or fosters animosity or hatred toward others. But they are they are oversimplifying what is a complex phenomena. Mm. And uh, this ethos of having a dislike or aversion towards others is more in those who identify with spirituality as group centered and mm. less in those who are uh, those who have the personal piety as a value, that's a driving value. Then we discussed also about the practice of, uh, of presenting spirituality in terms of 
in terms of post material values so yeah. for those who are suffering because of the lack of basic material needs the idea of the of the world being a distressful place can register but for those who have had sufficient comforts sufficient basic needs like you said the world has gone a sil- silent revolution but uh, so then the material needs are not a primary concern then we have to spend a lot of time trying to trying to prove to them that their experience of the world is wrong that they are actually unhappy when they feel that i am not unhappy so instead yeah. of that <laughs> we try to present it how that uh, spirituality can be an adventure so if somebody wants exploration then spirituality can be presented as an adventure and uh, there is abundant scope for that so in this there are different aspects of this post material values you said some somebody might be more intellectual then there are aspects of philosophy that can be presented some uh, so there could be somebody who wants tolerance tolerance or love of nature those aspects could be highlighted so we could say that our tradition is like a you could say it's like a big super mall with almost 8 million 8 billion shops as many as there are human beings and everybody can be given everybody can find what they need so or not to they can it is rather than simply trying to get everyone to fit into one program we try to understand their profile and then make a program for them or present that part of our program which which will serve their need yeah. and uh, some people may eventually come toward the full program and some people may not but that is what will happen in every path even people yeah. who come for a direct like a temple temple program thousand people may come for janmashtami but maybe maybe 10 or 5 may become devotees in the conventional sense of the word so that funneling effect will be everywhere and then we discussed about how shila prabhu uh, that this this could be actually a part of service attitude and uh, as we learn to have a conversation with people rather than simply giving a discourse that yeah. then we don't need to necessarily read specialized psychological books but we could just focus on understanding people by talking with them and then we can address their needs better so anything you want to add prabhu anything important that i missed out or you want to like to conclude with something uh, yes one thing came to my mind now that i heard your very comprehensive summary was that the the psychological profiles go both ways so one aspect is to think about the needs of the audience or, or the student but the other one is i think equally important is one who is in the role of teacher we can also not i think successfully pass beyond our own profile uh we would naturally feel more comfortable uh making a presentation which we find inspiring us do you see what i mean okay so uh Uh, i think uh it's a natural match that the teacher or preacher uh <clears throat> would uh find a way to make a successful presentation or create a successful program which is tailored to the needs of people who have somewhat similar uh or at least not totally opposite kind of profile or nature oh okay so i think you mentioned that initially also that it is uh, that it's not just for attracting people catching people's initial attention but also in terms of helping them understand their swabhava so yeah. that they can sustain their practice so that can apply to us also yes so when we are trying to share yeah i think that's so true mm, yeah that like some devotees may become very successful in in is say in the social media you know it's it's so easy to compare who whose posts or whose videos or whose talks get how many views how many downloads and one may start thinking that i have to become like that person to be successful yeah but you know their their nature might be different so we have to find out how best we can be yeah and exactly yeah so so in one sense it, it's also you could call this almost something like a enlightened selfishness that uh, in the sense that 
I understand what will serve my need, what form of outreach will serve my need. And then, yes, some people will be attracted to that. So I'm selfish in the sense that I am doing outreach according to my way, according to what works with my nature. But mm. it's enlightened in the sense that actually I, it, it is helping me rise and I'm also helping some people rise. But if I try to become, uh, if we try to do outreach in, some, in a way that is not compatible with who we are, then that is, uh, that is what Krishna says, don't follow another dharma even if it is, even if it is uh, good looking. Yeah. Follow your own dharma. Yeah, that was basically my point that because I have discovered in my uh, own work and uh, th- teaching that uh, if it ever works, those cases when it works, when it seems that people kind of grasp something and take something home and take up the practice, it's because I was just doing it the way I felt natural with and whenever I try to, you know, play somebody else and uh, give a presentation where I don't feel at home, then it somehow I think in a subtle way it comes across that who is he trying to be and uh, why is he saying something which he doesn't believe in. Yeah, that's true. In one sense, one other, I think another post, uh, I don't know whether it's a post material value. People are very sh- people value integrity a lot mm. integrity in the sense that you know or, or we could say authenticity yeah they, they 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 if they see that you are not really being natural or you are you are just keeping a what do you say building an image of yourself to attract and that puts off thoughtful people yeah true Agreed. yes true. wonderful so nice talking with you Thank you very much for sharing your time, your wisdom you. and your Hare. experiences. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.